Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Retinal Realities Youth Edition podcast. This particular podcast is in light of World Youth Skills Day, celebrated on the 15th of July, 2023. This very momentous day recognizes the importance of equipping and empowering young people with skills to transform their future, and I guess also transforming the world at large. So with that said, I'm extremely delighted to introduce an exceptionally talented gentleman, Hilton Langenhoven. Hilton is a former Paralympic athlete with an amazing portfolio and he has participated in seven world championships and four Paralympic Games. Hilton has also attained a Commonwealth Medal. And so Hilton does all of this, living his life to his full potential with a visual impairment. It is my absolute pleasure to be engaging with you on this platform of Retinal Realities. So welcome, Hilton. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Sonia. Now, thank you so much for having me on this platform. I'm extremely excited to have a chat with you guys tonight. Yes. We're also extremely excited. And also with me here this evening is my co-host, Samantha Daniels, also a member of Retina South Africa. Sam, thank you for making the time and welcome. Thank you, Sonia. And good evening, Hilton. Good evening, Samantha. So, guys... Hilton, we're just going to ask you a few questions to try and and get as most uh, out of you in terms of getting to know your journey and your motivational message to the youth out there. So, Sam, would you like to kick off with the first question? Sure. Thank you, Sonia. Okay, Hilton, Sonia has mentioned quite a number of phenomenal achievements in your life so far. Can you tell us how and when did the love and interest for athletics develop? Um, Samantha, we obviously have do have a history. We school together and being at the Athlon School for the Blind, you know, and where I grew up as a youngster in Somerset West on a wine farm in the in, in the 80s, where I think the Dobstelsel was one of the main systems of how they pay farm workers in their time, you know, and I have to see my family and friends dwindling into alcohol in their time, you know, um, I couldn't make a description and say, okay, so this is right or wrong. But once I grew up and then understand that what alcohol meant to the people on the farm staying there, it was a bit concerning for me, you know, but um, I couldn't come to school and told my story at school because I was a bit ashamed at the time and because I was albino as well. So I had to hide a whole lot of stories, you know, but once I got the opportunity to express myself on boarding school, um, once I got the opportunity to to show my talents, you know, and that, that I think that is where the last story starts of um, me being an athlete at school, playing soccer, playing cricket, playing rugby. And I always use that to enhance my popularity at school, you know, and I think um, sitting here and talking about this, you know, how... It could have negatively shaped my life or impacted my life where I could have just fallen into that trap as well, you know, sitting here and once in the position to talk and tell people my story in terms of where I come from, what I've achieved, you know, it's such a humbling experience, you know, coming home every night, you know, you've got a warm bed to sleep in. There's so much um, to be grateful for and grateful of, you know, and that is what sports it's done and shaped my life, you know, and continues still shaping my life and I'm in a position to give back to other people as well, yeah. Well, Hilton, thank you for sharing that. And it seems like your journey was just to always improve and better your life. And I think that's a stance that many young people should embark on, right? Can you tell us a little about your visual impairment in particular and how this impacted your passion for athletics and sports? Yeah, um, being albino, you know, the stigma about albinism in our communities is that there's a bad stigma around that you, you feel outcasted, you feel like you don't belong within society. And especially if you want to stamp your position with being an individual who can't stand on their own two feet, you know, there's always people around the corner that might just try to put you in a box and to make you feel like you're not part of society. We don't have a right to be here. But, you know, um, I've grown within my disability, I've grown within the capability which I have, you know, and it is by always proving people wrong, 
Um, I always working hard and extra hard as well because I knew when I left school and boarding school, the Athlon School for the Blind, is that I will need to work 10 times, 20 times harder than any other individual to achieve what I wanted to achieve, you know, and being able not to drive, you will need to be a committed individual knowing that you have to take public transport, you can't hide. And by taking public transport, you're exposing yourself to people that are so nasty and so many other elements, you know, crossing a road is difficult, you know. So uh, it's just to have that confidence and to commit to something when you get out of bed in the morning. My first thing that I do every day is committing to make up my bed, irrespective of how early it is, make up my bed. That's my first commitment towards myself and then off we go. So the other obstacles, it just seems to be so little, you know. And when you come back at night to a bed that you've made up yourself and how bad or how good the day was, you've come back to something that you've done um, constructively first thing in the morning. So extreme discipline, I'm guessing, from your side, from, from what I'm hearing you say, mm. in order to fulfill your dreams. Absolutely, yes. A very, very interesting, Milton. So tell me, as an athlete with a visual impairment, how do you cope within the field and what support systems do you have in place? Obviously, um, I'm a member of SASA PD, the South African Sports for the Physically Disabled, and they are a sub-member of the South African Sports Confederation of South Africa, which is called SESCOC. In order for you to get support as a disabled athlete, you need to be ranked top four in the world, irrespective of what event you do. The able-bodied athletes or the athletes without challenges, they go up to a leniency with a world ranking to top 16 and they can they can get the support, they can get all the sponsorships if they so have the credentials for the sporting codes. But as a person with disability or visual impairment, it is so, so, so difficult. You need to win medals, you need to break records, world records on a consistent basis for people to recognize you. And it is one of what of my colleagues called for the other day is that people need to start telling more disability stories so that people can understand that who these individuals are, when the, in these individuals are in the street, what their credentials are. So storytelling for dis disabled sport or disabled individuals is so, so, so much important. But I know in 2001, my first international competition, I went to France. I met my coach there for the first time as well. And she asked me, why am I zigzagging in the lane? Don't you trust um, what's in front of you? And um, in that moment onwards, I realized that you're in a track. There's no obstacles. It's a secure space for you to run. So it's a secure space to express yourself. And that is where the freedom comes in. That is where the freedom of growth, development comes in as an athlete, you know. So if you're free to move around, Knowing there's no obstacles, there's people that you can trust in, then only therefore you can continue growing and your conf confidence will continue growing as well. I absolutely agree mm -hmm. with that, Hilton. And within this platform, Retina South Africa's Youth Edition, that's what we're striving for, to create a platform and a safe space where we can create awareness and support each other. As I mentioned in the intro about World Skills Youth Day, and so in spirit of this special day and your very special role as a sports coach, what do you believe are the key elements or factors in nurturing one's passion into success, just the way you've harnessed your own success? I think that's extremely important is when... You walk in the space of the youth is that you don't make distinction in terms of I have achieved this, I have done this, and therefore you can't tell me. There's always ways to learn from the youth as well. And I don't use my credentials. I don't use my name. I'm walking into their space, you know. I'm more there to learn from them. I'm more there to nurture and coach them and guide them so that they can live out their lives. We can't live our lives through the youth or my life through the youth as a coach, you understand. So I will give them freedom of expression. But with that freedom, slowly but surely, the confidence and the responsibility part will kick in. And whenever there is failure, we will sit down and, and understand and see where does this failure come from? Was it fear of failure? Was it purely a lack of preparation? Or was it a lack of resources, you know, um, not having a proper meal, not having a lift to each and every training venue? And that is the most important thing, you know. I'm a visually impaired, so I can't drive. And then one day, I think it's what, it was last season, about five months ago, a couple of my um, school kiddies asked me, can't I give them a lift back home? <laughs> and I need to quietly laugh and just explain to them, listen, yeah, I do my utmost best to be confident out there to coach you guys. And, uh, and I think, therefore, 
you guys are not in the position to judge and say I'm visually impaired, but I am visually impaired and therefore I don't I can't have a driver's license. It's not that I don't want to, I can't have a driver's license. And then we had a nice conversation and sit down and then they ask me about my disability and everything I get. And the next day when we come back, they ask me, can they move obstacles away from me? And I said, no, I'm more than comfortable. You know, I'm here to guide and coach you guys as learners and as athletes, and I'm here to journey with you. And whenever there's questions, we can always sit down and have a conversation in the means of storytelling or sharing moments with one another so that we can grow together as coach and as athlete. Wow, that's that's phenomenal. And I'm sure every day is special in terms of your coaching. It reminds me of Messi, the football champion's story and his fight against all odds because he simply believed in himself and had a dream that he needed to accomplish. So I guess winning is, is a mindset. Uh, Hilton, you, you make reference to failure or to be prepared. I see you, your mantra is don't cheat your work out, break up with your comfort zone. Can you briefly tell us at which stage in your life did you expand beyond your comfort zone and how did it make you feel? Sam, I think it was two years after I left school. And school was, and, and boarding school was such a comfort zone for me because it was kind of a shelter and a haven for me. And I've always knew that I would never wanted to go back home and to go to go fall back within the system that was created amongst the family members. And I think the second year after school was a difficult year because it was the year of the Paralympic Games in Athens in 2004. But I was not financially able to get to training every day, but also I didn't have financial support before the Games. But I knew if I can just go to the Games and get to the Games healthy, I can maybe win a medal and get come back to South Africa and have my first Paralympic medal. And then from there onwards, I think life will be much, much better. So what I've done in the morning, I've wake up. I've never laid because I don't have funds. I've wake up in the morning. I've walked 15 k's to the train station. If there was a control over the trains where I couldn't travel with a train to Stellenbosch, then I would have gone to the police station and tell the police that I've got marked. Isn't there a lift for me to sell on boss? Because I need to go to training because I'm in preparation for the Paralympic Games in, in Athens. You understand? I, I, I don't think it was cheating the system, mm. but I, it was mm. persevering to me to get to a point mm. where there was uncertainty coming back home for me as well because I need to repeat that same cycle. You understand? And there was never a, a fact that I could have asked for friends or family for money because they were not in a position to help. And only once... I have the doors open for me. It became a bit easier. It became a bit less strenuous on the legs by walking 15 k's up and 15 k's down and sitting in traffic or in public transport for half a day that you need to go to training. And I knew if that phase of my life can just go as quick by as possible, but I'm learning as much as possible throughout that journey so that I can take that back with me once everything is getting better and easier for me. And I've always taken that moment in life um, with me, you know. Wow, Hilton, that's yeah. that's an admirable, courageous story of, I guess, extreme resilience and faith and belief in yourself. In closing, Hilton, do you perhaps have a message for the youth of Retina South Africa who are aspiring to achieve a career in the world of sports? Yeah, definitely. I think for us as beginners, starting off our careers as, as individual or blind athletes, the first obstacle is just right in front of you. It's just you need to be confident overcoming that obstacle, overcoming that hurdle, because as an individual person, people living with blindness, we've got so much obstacles on our journeys. There's so many people that we are dependent on. There's so many things that we, we can't just wake up, get into a car, get to a job interview, get to a training session. There's people that you rely on. There's systems you need to put in place. So if that one individual is late, it's going to make you late and and, and that's going to have a ripple effect in terms of how you will perform in your training system and that will have ripple effects how you'll perform in your competition if there's an international competition coming up. So it's always to be patient, but always have a backup plan if one individual can't make it. And then if that backup plan doesn't work, commit to your own plan and that is by getting towards your training session. Irrespective of the example, what I've used now is yes, it was a bit of cheating, but I was so committed going to the sessions. But there's so much, I think, in sports, in the world of us being blind, there's this blind cricket, there's goalball, there's athletics, there's cycling, there's rowing, there's so much. It's just that 
we need to go and do research in terms of what we can and with the way our thresholds of our bodies is, our mindsets, and never to be in a comfort zone, never to be in a zone where you're too reliable on people getting you to a certain space. I think we need to challenge your courage to get to a training session. Like, for instance, I must travel an hour and a half um, towards my school when I do my coaching at school. I must do my sessions just two and a half hours. I must come back as well. So I need to plan. It's not like I can half an hour before the time, hey, I must go now, decide to go. I must plan three and a half hours ahead in terms of that. So if you can get your preparation plan going, I think you will always be in, in control of your goals and your desires one day. Yeah. I most definitely agree with that. I think um, organizing your schedule and your lifestyle and, and your to-do list is so important because yeah. that's how you get around things. And like you said, there's always a dependency on other people or traveling. But thank you for that fantastic message. Thank you for your time, your valuable time and your motivating message to our youth out there. We here from Regina, South Africa, wish you everything of the best. And it's yeah. been an extreme honor and a privilege to chat to you, Hilton. Thank yeah. you very much. I I've, I've can say something for all my Albino colleagues out there who, who might listen or and who's ever facing troubled times in terms of how to cope in and to fit in. I would encourage them just to have faith and to have courage to go out there. You know, people will look at you. You can always turn a blind eye, put your sunglasses on, or if you do experience physical or verbal abuse, you look different, you know, that it's, 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 a, it's an absolute blessing. If I can just share this one story, in 2008, I went to the Paralympic Games, came back with three gold medals, the first South African athlete to come back with three track and field gold medals at the Olympics or Paralympic Games. And when I got to the airport, you know, there was one lady that came up to me in Johannesburg and she said, she didn't mention any names or anything. And she only asked me, are you the albino that did South Africa so proud over in Beijing, you know? And that word albino, it was a powerful question that she asked me because I always ask or question the Lord in terms of why am I the only albino in my family? Why must I endure all this punishment and abuse from mm. people? And that was, at the end of the day, my answer from the Lord on that day in the airport, yeah. So you need to have faith and, and courage to, to be able to live your dream out there. Most definitely an, a very inspiring story. And thank you for being open enough to share your journey and for others to use your mm. story as a light in their darkness. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To our listeners out there, thank you for listening. We're hoping that you guys will check us out on social media, touch base and make some contact with us. Um, you're more than welcome to check us out and follow us on YouTube, Spotify, Instagram, Facebook, and also our website, which has all our details. Sam, I'd like to thank you for your time and doing this podcast with me. You are so welcome, Sonia, and looking forward to connecting with everybody on social media. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> in closing, a very special thank you to Roche Products for making these podcasts possible by an unconditional educational grant. Thank you and good evening, everyone. <laughs>